Chinese robots have quietly taken over the moon. Well, not in a sci-fi way, but for the past few years, they've been up there, exploring regions we've barely seen before. They've been uncovering mysteries, making discoveries, and most importantly, collecting samples of lunar rock and dust, some of which have already made their way back to Earth. And in those samples, China found something new, something that could completely reshape how we think about the moon and maybe even life here on Earth. The thing about the moon is the more we learn, the stranger it becomes. Take Earth, for example. It's already kind of a weirdo among the rocky planets, not just because it's teeming with life, but because it doesn't act like its neighbors. And a big reason for that? Our big gray companion in the sky. Let's compare. Venus is almost a twin to Earth in terms of size and mass, but it doesn't have a moon at all. Mars, on the other hand, is smaller, about half Earth's size, and has two moons, but they're tiny, really tiny. Phobos and Deimos are just 22 kilometers and 12 kilometers across, respectively. You could fit both inside the city of Chicago. Now look at the gas giants. Jupiter, for instance, is 318 times more massive than Earth, and while it does have large moons, they're not much bigger than our own. That's strange, right? Earth's moon is unusually large for a planet our size, and scientists are still puzzling over how that happened. That's why we keep going back to the moon. When NASA sent astronauts there in the 60s and 70s, they brought back rocks and dust, and what stood out was how similar those lunar rocks were to ones on Earth. That wasn't supposed to happen. If the Earth and moon had formed separately, we'd expect them to be made of different materials, kind of like strangers who bumped into each other in space and started orbiting together. But the Earth and the Moon? They're more like twins, which led to a big question. How could they have formed at the same time, in the same place? After the Apollo missions, the leading theory became what we now call the Giant Impact Hypothesis. The idea is that about 4.5 billion years ago, early Earth was hit by a Mars-sized planet. Let's call it Thea. The collision was so massive it melted both worlds, and a huge chunk of Earth was blasted into space. Most of Thea was absorbed into what became our planet's core. The debris left behind eventually cooled and formed. The Moon. Just recently, researchers fed this theory into a powerful supercomputer. It ran millions of simulations. And the one that best matched what we know was nicknamed the Big Splash. It's the most detailed model yet, showing how our moon might have been born from Earth itself. So in a way, the moon is like a mini Earth that got split off during a cosmic disaster and then evolved on its own. Now keep in mind, this is still a theory. It fits the evidence well, but we're still gathering the full picture. And the more we uncover about the moon's past, the more we understand about our own origin story. These days, it's China that's leading the charge in lunar exploration. Over the last five years, their space agency has poured in resources, time, and tech, sending robotic explorers to the moon's surface in search of answers. And one place they've focused on the most? The far side of the moon. An area that until recently was practically a mystery. China made history when it became the first country to land on the far side of the moon. And even more impressively, they brought back material from it that scientists are still studying today. Now let's clear something up. Despite what Pink Floyd or Transformers might have led you to believe, the far side isn't the dark side of the moon. It gets just as much sunlight as the side we see from Earth. The only difference? It never faces us, and we never see it. So in theory, both sides of the moon should be pretty similar, right? Well, not quite. Ironically, the side we do see, the familiar face of the moon, is actually the dark one in a geological sense. 
It's covered in smooth, dark patches known as Lunar Maria, basins filled with ancient lava. Yeah, the moon used to have volcanoes. More on that later. But the far side, it looks totally different. Instead of dark lava plains, it's mostly pale gray, pocked with thousands of impact craters. No seas of cooled lava, just rugged, cratered highlands. Clearly, something is very different between the two sides. But what? To investigate, China launched the Chang'e 4 mission, which touched down on the far side in January 2019, the first spacecraft ever to land there. It was China's second lunar landing, and it deployed a rover called U-2-2, or Jade Rabbit 2, which began its slow crawl through the moon's von Karman crater. Now, this crater is no small pit. It's 180 kilometers wide, about the length of Cuba, and it sits within a much larger region called the South Pole Aitken Basin, one of the oldest and largest impact craters in the entire solar system. It's nearly 4 billion years old and stretches across 2,500 kilometers, which is just a little narrower than the country of India. Why are scientists so obsessed with this place? Because the asteroid that created this massive crater hit hard enough to punch through the moon's crust, possibly as deep as 13 kilometers, exposing rock from the lunar mantle. That's where the moon hides its deepest secrets. And for the first time ever, the U-22 rover found what scientists believe to be actual mantle rock, the thick, semi-solid layer that lies beneath the crust and above the core. Apollo missions never brought any of this back. This was a first, and it set off a wave of excitement among scientists on Earth because this kind of discovery can help us understand how the moon formed and how it evolved. But the mission had another strange moment. In December 2021, U-22 spotted something weird on the horizon a mysterious cube-shaped object sitting in the distance. It looked unnatural, like something placed there. For a moment, it sparked theories and excitement. Was this the monolith from 2001 A Space Odyssey? Not quite, it was just a rock. Turns out it was all a clever illusion, a trick of lighting, camera resolution, and the square pixels on digital sensors. Up close, it was just an ordinary boulder. Still, it was fun while it lasted. Fast forward to 2024, and China was back on the far side with Chang'e 6. This time, they weren't just there to look around. They were collecting samples to bring home. For the first time ever, material from the moon's far side was returned to Earth. And it was different. See, Apollo astronauts had brought back tons of rock and dust, but only from the near side mainly near the equator. So, for decades, we thought we had a solid idea of what the moon was made of. But now, it turns out, we were only seeing half the picture. The new samples from the far side were noticeably lighter in color, and their texture was surprisingly different. Chinese scientists noted the dust was thicker, stickier, and had more clumps and lumps than anything we'd seen before. Even more intriguing, while the far side is known for having fewer volcanic features, the lava samples that were found turned out to be much younger than expected. Why would that be? Well, one theory suggests that the far side of the moon cooled down faster than the near side. Back in those early days, Earth was still incredibly hot and violently volcanic, radiating heat out into space. That intense energy may have kept the near side of the moon warmer for longer, giving it more time for volcanic activity to play out. The far side, meanwhile, cooled in the shadows, literally and figuratively, and that's just scratching the surface. With every mission, China's lunar program is unlocking more pieces of this cosmic puzzle, reshaping what we know not just about the moon, but about our own planet's distant past. When Chinese researchers began exploring the far side of the moon, they expected to find some of the oldest volcanic material ever. 
and they were right. One lava fragment brought back by Chang'e, six dated back 4.2 billion years. That makes it the oldest moon rock we've ever discovered. But here's the twist. They didn't just find ancient rocks. They also uncovered younger volcanic material with an average age of 2.8 billion years, younger than many of the Apollo samples, which were mostly over 3 billion. So now we're starting to realize that the moon may have stayed hot and active much longer than we ever imagined. And that kind of challenges the popular Big Splash theory. Because if the moon formed from debris after a massive impact with Earth and it's smaller than Earth, then logically it should have cooled down faster, especially on the far side. But based on the new data, it didn't. Something doesn't add up. Which brings us back to the near side of the moon, the side we know best, thanks to the Apollo missions. But here's the thing, those missions were extremely limited. Astronauts could only land in flat, safe zones near the equator, areas that, unfortunately, are not the most interesting from a geological perspective. Even with lunar rovers, the total area explored across all Apollo missions is about 25 kilometers. That's smaller than Disney World. Think about it. If aliens landed in the Magic Kingdom, walked around for a few days, and then claimed they understood Earth, we'd call that a pretty poor sample. And this is exactly where China has started to flip the script. When Chang'e 5 launched, it became the first lunar sample return mission since the 1970s. And because it was uncrewed, China could land it somewhere far more scientifically valuable, a region called the Rümker Dome, in the northwest of the moon's near side. Now, lunar volcanoes aren't like Earth's. They don't erupt violently or leave behind jagged peaks. Instead, Moon volcanoes leak lava slowly over millions of years, forming broad, flat domes, like a bubbling pancake rather than a fire-breathing mountain. From around the Rümker Dome, Chang'e 5 brought back something amazing, the youngest moon rock ever returned, just two billion years old. That finding helped confirm what Chang'e 6 had hinted at. The moon was geologically active much later than we thought. But China's discoveries didn't stop there. Inside the Chang'e 5 samples, scientists found a new mineral, one we'd never seen before on Earth or the moon. They named it Changesite-Y, also known as Changate. It's not the usual dull gray rock you might expect. It's a transparent, colorless crystal. And although it's smaller than a human hair, it revealed something huge. It contains helium-3, a rare isotope that could be the key to limitless clean energy. Here's the deal. Helium-3 is deposited on the moon by solar wind. Earth doesn't get much of it because our magnetic field blocks that radiation, thankfully. But the moon, no atmosphere, no magnetic field. It's been soaking up helium-3 for billions of years. Why does that matter? Because helium-3 has long been considered the moon's most valuable resource. If we ever develop functional nuclear fusion reactors, helium-3 could power them with no dangerous radiation and no radioactive waste. It's clean, efficient, and potentially revolutionary. The only catch? We don't have those reactors yet, but we're working on it. In the meantime, another surprising find may prove even more important for the near future, water. Chang'e 5 found water in lunar soil. Not in a shadowy crater where we thought it might hide, but on the side of a volcano. And not just hydrogen and oxygen atoms scattered around. This time, they found full H2O molecules. The water was locked inside a hydrated salt mineral called ULM1, meaning the water is chemically bonded into the structure. It's like finding rocky ice or icy rock, however you want to look at it. Why is this a big deal? Because if water exists like this in many places across the moon, then we're not limited to building lunar bases and dark polar craters. It means we could, in theory, set up camp almost anywhere. A total game changer for long-term human exploration. 
And that brings us to China's bigger mission. Yes, understanding the moon's history is exciting, but planning for the future, that's where the real impact lies. Every rover, every mission, every grain of dust they bring back, it's all helping to lay the groundwork for human life on the moon. Back in the 60s and 70s, NASA could afford to send people for a few days, plant a flag, and call it a win. But if we're talking about building a permanent base, something sustainable, you need deep knowledge of the terrain, the resources, and the risks. And right now, China is leading that charge.